to get in, um, let's go ahead and make sure that we rename ourselves, adding your organization next to your name. And we'll give a few more minutes to make sure everyone has a chance to get so also, in. And also just remind you that the session is being recorded and it's gonna be posted on the NURSA website. Um, I think we've got a few more people that are coming in, but, um, and just want to make sure that, that you are muted. Um, and if you do have anything that you need to say, please use the chat box. Um, if you have any questions or comments. And then um, continue using the NURSA discussion board you know, after this is over and the ACA discussion board um, for continued conversation and additional resources. So, welcome. I think we have everybody right now. So. Um, so here are also some guidelines. Um, please be respectful of all attendees' concerns. This is a no judgment space, so um, no judgment. It's like, what is that, Planet Fitness? And then any discussion should focus around our role as higher education professionals. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Marissa and let her get us started. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start with a summer wrap up because we're towards the end of the summer and getting close to starting the school year. Um, let's go ahead and use the chat and if you operated during the summer, if you did any sort of programming, whether it's um, in person or virtual, go ahead and put it up in the chat and any challenges you came across or anything you want to share about how it went, please feel free to share that so that we all get an understanding of what other places we're doing. I myself ran a virtual program over the summer. Um, we limited it to four weeks and it went a lot better than expected. Uh, we were kind of expecting some low numbers and within about 48 hours of opening up registration, we were completely filled. Um, so we see Anna was doing youth programs all summer in person. Mm -hmm. How did that go, Anna? Were there restrictions? If you would like, you can unmute and share it out loud. Yeah, so it's definitely way different um, this year. So I'm not sure everybody else's youth programs are run, but one thing we had to do and that we are lucky because we are parks and recs, so we have several parks, is each camp has to meet in a different park and they can't cross over. Um, for a while, we actually, we weren't transporting kids at all. So there was no vehicle transportation. Or in the past, we would drive them, you know, to go to the lake or go kayaking or something. Um, this year it was meet at the location. Um, and then we had to change staffing around a lot because we used to have staff go on different days to the same camp. But this year we had to change everybody's schedules to make sure that our staff weren't changing and going in between camps and that they were only, um, staying with the same camp all week. Um, our camps do change rosters every week. It's not all camps are the same every summer. So that's been a challenge. Um, but Montana does have a lot less restrictions than other states right now. So that's also part of it. Okay. That's a really good way to distance everyone is having the separate parks. Allison, your virtual camps, did those go as expected? Were there any challenges? Um, well, so not having done virtual camps before, um, we learned a lot, but Erin, um, who works with me at the university, she and I attended one of the earlier round table discussions with NURSA, and that was extremely helpful. I don't even know that we were thinking at that level yet, and so I wanted to thank y'all for brainstorming. And so. What we did was um, we had two different types. We have a STEM program and I have robotics kits, the Mindstorm. And so we ran a virtual robotics camp. I had an instructor, thankfully from last summer, who is also a physics teacher and robotics instructor. So we kind of le leased the kits out and he did a virtual robotics camp and it filled up, parents loved it. And then we did another camp where it was more like the traditional day camp. We provided supplies and materials and we did drive-by pickup for parents and just did limited Zoom sessions. Um, and those, we had about anywhere between 15 to 20 kiddos in those and they seemed to enjoy that. So 
again, we learned a lot. Um, some parents were overwhelmed with the amount of virtual programming just because of their school and other parents were just grateful for somebody other than them interacting via Zoom, you know. So yeah, we learned a lot and I just wanted to thank y'all for helping with that. Of course, I'm glad it was very helpful. I know virtual programming was a whole new course for us, for everyone, it was a learning curve. Um, anybody else have any summer programs that they ran? You can go ahead if you feel comfortable to unmute and share. We'll just keep an eye on the screens. Anybody unmuted is about to talk. Okay, well, if you do feel like sharing, you can throw it up in our chat. The masks all the time. Was there issues with keeping the kids' masks on? Oh, for sure. <laughs> Um, it's definitely more stricter enforced among our staff than it is with the kids, um, but we also do basically give a pass. If all of our camps are outside, none of them are uh, located inside at this time. So if they can spread out to be like 10 feet away from each other, we, we are more lenient on that. We don't necessarily wear, make them wear their mask at that point. But if they're close with other people, they have to have their masks on. But yeah, for sure. I mean, they're kids, so they're going to try to take their masks off as as much as possible, but the longer they do it, the more they get used to it, so. That's true, the more it's enforced, the more second nature it'll become. So Anna, did you guys have any issues with keeping the kids with, you know, with the social distancing? Um, with each other, yeah. <laughs> Again, just because we're keeping all the camps separate, they're not necessarily mixing groups each week. So that just makes it easier physically not in the same location. But yeah, kids definitely come within six feet of each other all the time. What were some of the things that you guys did to you know, try to help with that? So we actually, one thing that we do is uh, for Missoula Parks and Rec is we give almost all of our kids buffs anyways that say Parks and Rec so they feel cool wearing them. And then we have, I mean, we have a lot of signs. We actually have a ninja pump sign that I, ooh, maybe I'll show it to you guys if my camera works. Hold on. Oh, that's me. I don't want me. Um, there we go. So we have a ninja pump sign <laughs> that we're encouraging kids. So you can see pump stands for physical distancing, um, use hand sanitizer and wash our hands, masks when asked, and then prevent germ spread. So I mean, they're, they're still kids, but also like the longer it goes on, hopefully the better it's getting. Oh, that's neat. I really I like like that. That. It's a neat visual reminder. Uh, for those who did run programs, or if you haven't, are you planning on doing any um, come fall 2020? So are you going to continue what you were doing in the summer or possibly develop something else for the fall? At this time, the University of Arizona, we are planning to run our regular fall break. And we have a fall break camp when the kiddos are out of school. We are limiting it um, to 30 children, so we can do three groups of 10, but it's tentative. Um, we are not publishing on our website or taking registration until after Labor Day in case, so that we don't take registrations and then have to deal with refunds. We're hopeful, um, but a little concerned about staff since we didn't have our mass hiring in May. Um, you, you, those college students usually carry us through with the fall break, winter break, and um, spring break camps. And so we're a little concerned there, but it's, we're planning good faith at this time. And Lauren said only visual online programs for the, for the fall. Lauren, do you want to share what your online programs are going to be about? Like what they're going to include? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. All right. So we do a lot of online fitness programs that are, um, we do Facebook Live. Um, we've been having some pick up DIY crafty kit bundles that they can purchase and then pick up on Fridays. And um, this week we are finishing up our Recreation Rocks um, contest, which is children set ages 17 and under decorate rocks and they turn them in by Friday. And then we're going to be placing them throughout our city on Saturday. And the first person to take a picture with all 10 rocks and submit it wins a 
prize craft bundle. That's neat. I really like that. Mm -hmm. Gets them out of the house. Mm -hmm. Yes, gets them out of the house, but they don't have to be around people. They're going to be in, they're going to be like on signs. Like we have a car museum and then like in front of our farmer's market. So places that are not high trafficy, where it's safe for them to get out. Um, and, but also, you know, just kind of have some mental, um, you know, programming as well. So we are, we are very new to this virtual programming <laughs> in the time of COVID for children. So we are learning our ways. We uh, I have a coworker that's doing um, painting with DP and he goes through and does, um, teaches how to paint um, a certain picture. Um, and then we are having line dancing on Mondays and a body blast class on Wednesdays that are all on Facebook Live. People don't have to have access codes or Zoom or anything like that. Um, our person that works with seniors, she's doing a phone virtual bingo. So we send them the bingo card um, on Fridays and then it's the next Thursday. And then we um, take the prizes out to them for the ones that win. For your oh, Facebook Live um, exercising courses, um, are those geared more towards the adults or the children? So we, they can be geared for, they're geared for at home, if that makes sense. So um, the line dancing is all the popular line dances. We did the, the get up this week. Um, we do four days of the week, some are repeat, some are new. Um, we do do a disclaimer that we are not professional line dancers. <laughs> we will probably mess up or whatever, but um, people seem to like it. And uh, the Body Blast is a class that we usually have, um, but we've geared it towards minimal or no exercise equipment. So different way to do is cr crunches or use cans or water jugs and, and things like that small stuff you can do at home and, um, you know, to get indoor exercise as to avoid going to the gym that you can't go to right now. Okay. Um, our senior, well, people that work with the seniors are also doing like a, a Facebook Live fall prevention and arthritis classes. So we're just now breaking away. We're in the process of doing a drive-through Halloween Spook Forest for October because we're fairly certain we're not going to be able to have our fall festival this year. So we're going to do like a one-way drive through one of our parks and then we're going to pre-make goodie bags to give to the kids in each vehicle um, at the end. So we are trying our very best. So Lauren, will your school, I mean, your, yeah, the public schools, are they going to do virtual or are they going to be in the classroom for the fall? So the our county schools are completely virtual along with one of our charter schools is completely virtual. Um, the charter school in town that my son goes to is, has the option of two days in school and three days at home or all virtual. And then we have one private school here that is doing five days in person. So, um, which is not what our governor is recommending. So I don't know how that's gonna go down for them. But um, our, our public schools, the, the county schools are doing for the first nine weeks, all remote learning. Okay. Um, okay. Anna, um, do you wanna share what your alternative to the Fall Family Festival is gonna be? Sure. So. Um, it's a little complicated, but usually we either we have both a fall family fest and a summer like kids fest, which obviously we had to cancel because those are huge events. Um, so instead, what we're doing is we're partnering with some local businesses that we reached out to, and we're going to do different stations. Um, so the business is going to have a table either we give to them or if they have one outside their business, so somebody can just walk up and grab something. Um, and it'll just be like a youth activity, whether that's a coloring page or how to do a craft page or how to, I'm listing off a lot of crafts, how to do an origami page. Um, or I know like the dentist uh, has like a kid friendly brochure on dental hygiene, whatever for kids, um, that's fun. And basically um, we're setting them up on different days 
sorry, this is like really complicated, but it makes sense in person. <laughs> um, so each weekend for four weekends, so a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday, each day of that weekend has two stations. Um, so that first Friday, it might be a dentistry place, and then the origami place. The next Saturday, it might be, um, you know, the martial arts place has a table outside there, and they're not manning these tables. These tables are just empty. Um, but then also every table that the kid and the family goes to, they get a raffle ticket. We haven't figured out yet if we're going to do um, in-person raffle tickets, if we're going to figure out an online system so to reduce touch points. Um, and then they get to submit their raffle tickets for a prize at the end of the month. Um, and then that just gives um, kids and families something to do and like a goal to do like something different each day um, on weekends. Uh, just in case, you know, they're still working during the day and they don't have time to go do that. We didn't want to do that on weekdays. Um, so we set them up during the weekends. And that's kind of our alternative for now. And then we got some local businesses just to donate prizes for the raffle at the end. Now, do families have to sign up for this? Or they, so there's going to be a limited amount. We were lucky enough to get a pretty good deal on just little drawstrings bags. Um, and a guy who gave them to a really good price and we got a sponsor. So we're making 200 of them. And then it's, we have up to 200 families. If they want, they can come and pick up their bag at some point. And that has the packet inside that says which activity is which day and where it is. Um, so limit 200, but that's how many. And then however many activities they choose to do is how many raffle tickets they'll get. Okay, that's a really neat alternative. Uh, anybody? So I'm going to jump in right quick. I know at the beginning, um, Marissa had asked if you could go in and, and rename so that we could see where you're from. Um, so I think maybe some, maybe not everybody heard that, but it, I think it would help if you could. So you just hover over your um, your box where you are, and you'll see the three dots. And if you could click that and then rename yourself, and then I think it would help us to see where people are from. Please. <laughs> Anyway, go ahead, Marissa. Sorry. Well, if anybody else has any other fall programs to share, feel free. I myself am developing one. Um, uh, it's going to be a lot more than what we did over the summer. Over the summer, we only served K-6. Um, and in the fall, we want to serve K-6 for camp activities, K-6 for tutoring, private and group. And um, our third... 13 to 15 year olds, we're trying to develop a leadership program for them. And all of this is going to be virtual. And I can say at Old Dominion, we did not run our camps this summer. The university made the decision that there were not going to be any camps held over the summer. Um, and we typically do not have programs during the school year. Um, this year, just about all of the public schools, K through 12 in our area are all going to be virtual. Um, our university will have some virtual, some in person, and a hybrid uh, type program for our university classes. And so we may put some things out, um, you know, virtual, just some information that we'll send out um, to some of our camp counselors or camp staff, not staff, campers who were registered for our program um, and even past campers. Again, just trying to keep our name in, in their minds. So, um, also I was telling Marissa earlier, um, I think I told Marissa earlier, but um, our governor came out and not allow any residential camps. So the only camps that could run in the state of Virginia were day camps, so. Well, thank you, Allison, for joining us. Yep, thanks, Allison. So my program, we're only thinking through fall at the moment and hoping to continue it in the spring. Um, and we have the hope that this will continue on. We were already planning on developing like a fall camp and a spring break camp and stuff like that, but now we could get this year round. Um, but because we don't know what the state of things are gonna be come January, we can't quite plan for spring, but there is the concern for next summer when all the camps are supposed to run again. Um, and Jean has some insight on that that she was researching. Yep, so um, I initially heard this on, I think it might have been Good Morning America or one of the, the morning news programs that um, 
they, you know, like the professionals are thinking that the, the corona, um, COVID is going to affect camps even into next summer. You know, they're, they're trying to get a vaccine to come out now um, in, in early 21, um, but not really sure if it's going to happen. Also that the vaccine, the, the, the life of the vaccine, you know, they're not sure if it's how long it's going to last. It might be something you have to get a vaccine every three months or every six months. But the speculation is that um, the effects of COVID-19 will hit camps in um, summer 21. And so thinking about um, you know, what is that going to mean for us? Um, and, and I guess that kind of also rolls into, you know, what did, what did we learn from, um, from COVID? What has it taught us? And then how can we take that into summer 21? So um, just curious to see what people are thinking for next summer. Has anyone started conversations with their universities about summer 2021? or even just thought about it yourself and have any ideas of what you may be planning? Um, so out here at Sunnydays Camp out in California, we did a virtual camp as well online. Um, we had about 35 campers a week, which is a far cry from our 350 in person that we typically did. But it's been interesting. Um, our counselors have really um, evolved to it. I think it's their, gen their generation. They just kind of just acclimated to it. Um, I was worried about the connection via, via screen, but it actually has happened. Um, tomorrow's our last day. We're actually going to do a drive through thank you because we've been doing curbside pickup throughout the summer. So tomorrow, I'm sure some of you saw that with other like schools as they were closing in the spring. Um, they were doing like drive through thank you. So we're going to do that tomorrow for our staff. Looking forward to next year. I mean, I've enjoyed this summer online, but I hope I never have to do it again. <laughs> but I've also heard the same information, Gene, that it might be around for a while. So we've started talking about that even if camp is in person next summer, there still might be some parents that don't feel comfortable um, sending their kids. So we're actually thinking of maybe doing a hybrid next summer. So doing our in-person if we're allowed to. Because um, like most of us on a campus, it's not just the local ordinances, but it's also our campus. But if we're allowed to operate in, in person, that's the plan. That's what we're budgeting for. But I am starting to have discussions about also incorporating a hybrid where some kids could um, participate remotely and they wouldn't have to come to camp. What, what we did is um, we actually set up four of our camp rooms as Zoom rooms. Um, so we have four groups because we did, we did from five to 15 year olds. So we have four different groups. So we have four different rooms that are each themed differently. It was a lot easier because we only had to decorate one wall as opposed to four, because mm -hmm. <laughs> only the wall they could see. Um, so we, uh, we did that and we've been zooming from there, which has been pretty successful. So the thought is that next summer we would create one room, again, if we're in person, we'll create one room as that Zoom room. And then for those campers that we have online, then we would just Zoom from there and that we might hire staff because we typically hire, I'm sure like all of you do, you know, full day, half day closing and whatnot. So we're thinking that we'll actually create a job description for an online counselor. Because um, one thing that we did really learn this summer um, was that it takes a certain kind of counselor to do in person, but then it takes a different kind of counselor almost to do online because to connect and make that engagement, it was just a lot harder online. Um, luckily, our, our seven counselors at work did an amazing job. So we're going to tailor that job description a little different because we know we'll have to look for different individuals that can handle that online um, component. The other thing we're going to do is um, we've been utilizing Google Classroom as our platform. And our, every year, our registration goes live February 1st. And what we're thinking we're going to do is that starting February 1st, we'll incorporate our Google Classroom and do a few activities throughout the week wouldn't be as intensive. Like right now we're doing 9.30 to 3.30. We wouldn't do that in February and March. But we think that might be a good way for returning campers to reconnect and connect with counselors. And then for those new campers that come to our program, even in those months leading up to camp, once they get registered, they can start interacting with us and get to know us. And then that anxiety on that first day maybe not, may not be as much. So we've been thinking 
that down the road that this could even be useful, what we've learned from this summer to incorporate in those ways. We've even thought about um, when campers miss a day or if they go to Oregon or Nevada to see grandma, they can still log on and still, you know, do a few, maybe do opening Zoom and maybe do, there's one activity that we Zoom for those kids that miss it. So we're, we're trying to be as creative as possible to, you know, cause we think next summer there's going to be a wide spectrum of some parents are like, take my kids. <laughs> they need to do what they need to do and be kids. And there's going to be other parents that, you know, don't want to do it. So it's, it, it, it was definitely a learning experience and went really well. Um, and we're definitely going to try to incorporate it moving forward in the future summers. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk that long. No, no, that's fine. Um, is your virtual and in-person going to run, run um, simultaneously? Yeah, that would be the plan. So we always start up uh, right when our school district's LAUSD. So when LAUSD lets out, uh, we typically start up that Monday after. So we would follow that program. Um, and then offer the virtual for the same amount of weeks. We'd obviously have less enrollment for that. Um, and because we'd want to have those kids stay with those counselors throughout the entire summer. But yeah, we would run. We just probably wouldn't run as many hours because our in-person hours are 730 to 6. And that probably would be hard screen time. But we would kind of do what we're doing now. We do a, we do opening Zoom at 930. And then there's a 10 o'clock activity and 11 we do a lunchtime lounge where they can hang out with us and have lunch. And then we do a one o'clock and then we do a close at 2.30. So our online platform would probably follow that structure because um, I, don't, I don't think that 7.30 to six would work online uh, screen time. And just, it does take more for parents to be engaged, especially with younger campers. Um, Cause some of the activities we do, the parents actually have to help. So I, I know it would be challenging for them to be there that entire day. Did you experience any Zoom fatigue with your campers? Uh, no, but what we have experienced is that some of the campers will like strategically miss. So like they'll be at 9.30, they'll be at 10, and then they won't be at 11 and they'll be back at lunch. Or they'll do the 9.30, 10, 11 and lunch, and then they're gone for the rest of the day. So as the summer, it bothered me when the summer first started, but as it went through, I'm a parent too, I have a 14 year old. So as the summer went along, I figured that that was probably just their schedules and some of the kids have pools and, you know, grandma nearby and maybe the mom had to go and run errands. So I think it kind of worked that they kind of picked and choose when um, they were able to access. What we do is in the Google Classroom every morning at nine, we put new links. That's part of our safety measures every day. There's new links. So the kids have the links there so they can access all of them or none of them. It just depends. So it's been interesting to see. We kind of know it's like 11 o'clock. We're like, oh, yeah, Levi's never on the 11 o'clock ones. Like we just, they've kind of fallen into a pattern. That makes sense. That's what we were seeing with our camp too. We had two sessions morning and afternoon and some would show up in the morning. Some would only show up in the afternoon and very few would do like both. Typically it would be the older ones. Yeah. Does anyone want to share anything that they've learned about camp? Um, with COVID, I know Anna seems to have learned that planning ahead doesn't seem to work. Uh, Mike here with California. It's, it's something I'm still trying to learn. Um, for those that did the camps and summer camps with kids, how many of those camps were actually profitable? or did we end up losing money by doing these camps and we just did them out of the kindness of our own heart? Um, and then also what was the retention of the camps? What kind of feedback did you get from the campers and the parents of saying, yes, we'll do it again, or no, we'll do it this one time, but not the next week? For my camp, um, it was all virtual. We didn't charge for it at all. We used it as a like marketing strategy. <clears throat> And also to keep the kids with kids you in mind, because we want them to think about our camp every summer and want to join us again. Um, and we, in the beginning, we got some feedback that we were being a little too childish. So for the older kids, we started changing everything up. The older kids got more mature activities and everything. And then the younger kids still got the, okay, how do we put safety first? Um, Whereas the older kids are like, I know how to be safe and participate. 
Um, but by the end, a lot of parents were very grateful that there was something for their kids to do while they were trying to work. It was just difficult for about the five to seven year olds to stay engaged. Yeah, for us, we charged, um, if this would have been a regular summer, our rate this year would have been 255 a week for in-person. What we ended up charging, we charged $50, uh, and a $75. So $75 goes with material and $50 was, uh, without materials. So parents would go and get their own, uh, materials. What we did for our currently, cause when all this COVID stuff happened in March, we were about 85% sold out and we had about 375 unique campers already in the system. Um, luckily, we hadn't collected payment in full because as it was, we had to do about 120000 in refunds, which was a nightmare. Um, what we offered them was that we would give them the $75 price for a $15 discount. So basically for $60. So a majority of our parents actually took advantage of that. And it was a steal because you can imagine trying to go to Walmart or Target and trying to get all the, all the stuff we do every week. Um, for the parents that didn't get the materials, um, every Friday we post a material list for the next week. So they know what they need to go out and get, whether it's construction paper, you know, the cooking activity, whatever it is. Um, we actually have, um, we have one camper in Georgia. We have a camper in Texas. And then we actually have campers that are from the LA area, but typically wouldn't come to camp because it's too far. So like I, I drive, I'm 35 miles away. I live in LA, but work at Northridge. I have a few friends from my neighborhood that their kids got in that would never come to in-person because they'd have to spend the whole day with me. They'd have to drive out here, spend the whole day, and then, hey, I don't leave till 6.30, so you're stuck. So it's, it's been interesting with the online platform um, is having you know kids in Georgia, kids in uh, Texas, and then also some out in this area. So that's been the other reason we've been thinking about moving forward. We might still incorporate the virtual because we just have a, further, a farther reach of who we can attract. So that was interesting to see that. I hadn't even processed that when we started. I'm like, oh yeah, it doesn't matter. You can be anywhere in the nation as long as you have Wi-Fi. So. And was it profitable for you? Oh yeah, uh, no, it was not. Um, we ran out of deficit, um, but uh, I actually, in er, mid-June, we're our last days today. We were gonna go till mid-August, but we decided not to do the August week. So we did seven weeks from June 15th until tomorrow. Back in June, I was only forecasted to have like 16, 17 kids the last couple of weeks. But once we got started and word of mouth, we actually got up and we've averaged about 35 across the board. So our deficit that I was approved to run with, we actually slashed in half um, because of our increased enrollment. So we did run at a deficit, but it was half of what I begged them to let me run. And I think somebody said earlier about that, trying to keep your brand out there and your name. That's kind of what my argument was. I'm like, look, every summer, because this is my 18th year, every summer we make a profit. Like, you know, I'm good for it. Let me lose money this year, but we keep our brand out there. And even though we have, you know, we have like 61 unique campers, we're making a difference to those 61 campers. We don't have our 500 unique campers like we typically do, but to these 61 kids, you know, we're making a difference. Um, I, I, and it's funny because every summer, like I'm sure all of you do, we all think we're doing a great job, but then we get hit with parents, you know, complaining about this and that. I haven't had one complaint this summer. So like the online in that regards was amazing. Um, one parent in particular, like it really stuck with me. Um, we were emailing about pickup a couple of weeks ago and she said, you know what, Jeremy, she's been in camp. Her kids have been in camp for a while. She goes, you know, Jeremy, I really want to thank you. Um, she goes, both me and my husband work, and she used a, a, a powerful word. She goes, we were worried about neglecting our kids this summer, but with your program, we feel comfortable doing what we have to do to support our family, knowing that our kids aren't neglected, that there's somebody there hanging out with them, and they're engaged, and they're connecting. So, like, I went home that day, and I'm like, man, we did do a good thing, because if, if anything, that one parent didn't neglect her kids because we were there to help. So, yeah, it's, it's been a powerful summer, I would say. Wow, good. Very good, thank you. Does anyone have any other questions to pose to our little group here? Sure, I'll go again. Uh, activity classes. Did anybody do any type of activity classes? And I'm referring to uh, like, for instance, we do dance classes for kids. We do Taekwondo classes for kids, tennis lessons for kids. But those are all in person before all this hit. Um, we haven't done anything since. But did anybody do any type of activity classes? And if so, did you have any luck with it, any success with it? 
on Thursday, it's actually going on right now. Thursdays at 11, we do an all camp activity. So regardless of age, all the campers can zoom in and we have one of our counselors that leads an active activity. So um, he's, found, he's found some stuff on the internet that's like for kids, like self-guided um, activities. So he shares his screen and the kids follow along and it's actually been kind of, kind of interesting to see the kids like get their workout for that one hour a week. Um, some of the other groups as part of their program have tried the program and then they're able to do it more specifically for their age group. Um, so it, it is a little bit of a challenge over the screen, but I have seen, I've watched it and the kids are engaged. The other thing that we did, um, cooking is a big thing that we do when it's in-person camp. Um, so we have been doing cooking on Fridays at one, but we've been doing everything no bake. So it's either just microwave or just something that you don't have to bake because we don't want them worrying about the ovens or any of that. And that's been very successful. That's been one of our higher um, attended activities is the lunch is the cooking activities on Fridays at one. Now, now I'm assuming when you do these classes, the parent is home or around when they're doing this or are most of the parents gone or off in a whole other room while they're doing these activities. So our, our, we put it in our waiver. We redid our waiver this year. And part of our waiver, there was a couple things. One of them said that whenever the child is on, there has to be a guardian over the age of 18 in the house. So we don't want the parents saying, hey, here you go, Zoom for six hours, we'll be back. Um, and then we put anybody that was under, I wanna say it was seven, I'll have to go and look at it. I haven't seen it for a few weeks. Anybody younger than seven, we do want the parent or an older sibling or somebody there in the area assisting. So when I, like for the active activities, when I'm watching it, just on Zoom, seeing them do their thing, you can see parents in the background. There, we have two younger kids, one one is five and I think his brother's four and their grandma like almost every day participates <laughs> in all the activities that they're doing. So yes, the younger kids typically have an adult or an older sibling nearby, but we did put in our waiver that anytime that the kid's on there has to be a guardian over the age of 18 in the house. So what about you know, that one family that you were just saying that, that they were feeling that their child was gonna be neglected, but then they could go to work and know that, knew that um, and you probably didn't know that that was happening till, till after the fact. Yeah, well, they're still in the house. And actually that one okay. kid's camera okay. is set up. You can see the dad okay. working. He has a station like in the other part. They have a big okay. family room. Yeah, so what she meant by going to work, I should have clarified that. She just meant working from home, but they didn't want to neglect their kids because they're working from home and can't interact with them. So we're able to interact with them with them still in the house. Yeah, okay. good clarification. Um, Anna had a question on equity. Um, Anything that anyone is doing to address someone who might not have access to a computer? I had a hard time thinking about that and we honestly couldn't come up with a solution for that. Um, it was if you had a computer, you could join in and it was free of charge. If there was no device, then it wasn't, they weren't able to participate, but the majority of kids K through six had a computer given to them by school. They typically have like a Chromebook. Um, and with the, all the schools going virtual and because they didn't know how long they were gonna go virtual or the um, sanitation and disinfectant of the computers when they would get delivered back, they just said to keep it for now until we come back in person. So the majority of the kids already had one at home. Yeah, the, the other piece of the equity is like most of you all, I'm sure you have special needs kids that go to your in-person camp. That was one thing that we were kind of figuring out how could we do that um, online. This week, we actually have a former camper. Um, her sister used to come and now her younger sister who has autism, her mom reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and said, you know what, I really want her to try it. And her older sister is willing. So Jasmine's 11 and Marcella's 14. She said Marcella's willing to assist her so I told her, I go, you know, that's the one struggle I've had with online is I can't have that one-on-one -on -one person I typically could do with in-person. So what I worked out with her is I only charged Jasmine her rate, but then her sister, Marcella, I only charged her the $10 fee for the materials. So um, she's been on this week and she's been loving it. She's been on, I've went, and, I've went and made a point of going and watching her and she's doing her thing. Her sister's right there helping her out. Sometimes her mom is helping her out too. So I'm glad for at least one camper uh, with special needs that we were able to assist. And so, you know, I was thinking about, um, you know, part of what have we learned from COVID and thinking about our students who are in elementary education majors. And, you know, now I think I said earlier that all of our public schools are going virtual 
And you know, this is a great, <clears throat> a great thing for them that you know, if those that worked virtual summer camp for you guys, I mean, they might have a step up that you've already had to leave classes virtually over the summer. So when you, you know, this is probably something that's going to be with us for a while, you know, and not only because of COVID or whether it's something else, but I think it's kind of opened up virtual camps to a lot of people as an alternative or an additional way to run camp. So I think we're going to be seeing more virtual camps coming up. So I think it's also good for our college students that they're learning how to do this. Yeah, I could share a personal story. So one of my staff, so my staff, if they graduate in the May, they're able to still work that summer. So I had a staff member that had been with me for a couple of years. She graduated going and teaching professor and um, actually got, got offered a job in June. So we knew we were going to lose her halfway through and she's going to start virtually teaching next August. Well, next month. So um, she worked three weeks with us. Um, and when she left, she told me, she goes, you know what, Jeremy, I was so nervous about starting, especially that it was going to be online, but doing this for three weeks and having this experience and, and trying it out, like I'm, I'm ready, like I'm totally ready and excited to start. So it's kind of cool on that development piece that you're speaking of for the students that we know it happens every year in person, but to see that it also happened uh, online, because now her camp name was Relish, you know, Relish is going to be a first year teacher and she's ready to go. Like she, she has the experience and she's ready to go. I, I completely agree with everything that's being said right now. And I can honestly say and feel that schools will never be the same after this. Um, schools are already heavily impacted over enrollment, financially in trouble. And by offering online courses, if you look at scheduling, schools can now actually increase population of the school and decrease salary wise with what's going on. And so it's gonna be a huge trend from here on out with teaching online. But as we know what starts down in the elementary eventually trickles all the way up to the college level. And so what does that actually mean for us as higher ed and what's gonna become available? Universities are gonna start moving more towards online and giving up real estate uh, because it's expensive. Brick and mortar is expensive. Um, so where do we fall into that category? And the one thing that we are heavily impacted by is the physical ability and, and having to do in-person activity. But we have to start shifting to an online platform. And I think anything we do from here on out will have to have the mindset of in-person and virtual. And that's the era that we're going to start living in. Um, starting now. So yeah, it's, it's, inter it's interesting how things are rolling out. Yeah, I, I also oversee our intramural sports department in our games room. So obviously, um, the CSU system has already said fall is going to be virtual. So there's not many classes. So in those departments, we're starting to do a lot of stuff virtually. And we've already been talking kind of what you just said, Michael, that even when we start doing sports in person, there's probably going to be a segment that's going to want to play NBA 2K at 11 o'clock at night. So figuring out just down the road, when we can get back in the gym, okay, some people are gonna to wanna to get back and play five on five, but some people are gonna to wanna to play NBA 2K. So how do we you know, meet people where they're at and, and serve both communities? So yeah, Michael, we've been having those discussions already. So anybody have anything else? Either um, what we've learned from COVID or what you plan to do next year or just in general? I'm going to go back to Michael's question about um, activities. We had um, physical activity courses, like we offered two sessions a week of rec activities, which was supposed to be exercise and moving around. And we found that our kids were not very, very engaged during those. The majority of the time they wanted to sit and talk and catch up. Um, so we would kind of accommodate them. So we would be like, okay, we're going to do five minutes of yoga and then we can talk and play other games and we'd send them on scavenger hunts. So to keep them engaged, we'd be like, okay, go find something that's six feet long, yellow and can change size. And so they'd run around the house trying to find this one object that fit these very specific goals and that's how we'd get them active. Um, but other than that, our performing arts went pretty well. 
Um, it was difficult via Zoom because it was just a bunch of boxes on the screen, but the kids would um, make poems or um, make a song or they'd put together a skit and we'd work really hard to make the skit work virtually and the kids just absolutely loved it. Yeah, it's been interesting as we've gone through the summer, how many things that are in person actually translated online. So in person, I'm sure it's the same for you. You know, your your four to eight year olds, arts and crafts, they like doing all that stuff. Nine to 11, they just want to run, you know, and be active all day. And then you've got your older kids that are just too cool for school. It's been the same online. The younger kids have been all about the arts and crafts. They love it. That nine to 11 group has been our group that like, hey, sit down, pay attention. We try to do more active activities with them. And our leadership kids, our, our soul, we call it skills of leadership, our 12 to 14 year olds, they just like to do, there's this thing called scribble or what's that called, Sean? It's just scribble. scribble and they just like draw and they have to guess it. They like playing Kahoot. They just like hanging out. Just think of in person, it's each age group is doing exactly what they would have done in person. It's just over the screen, which has been interesting. How was it for the instructor to retain attention, class control, um, all that? I mean, do you have instructors that are saying, I'm done, I'll never do it again? Or do you have instructors saying, no, nah, it wasn't that bad? Uh, all my counselors said that they loved it. I have I have one counselor in particular that she's, she came here when she was nine as a camper, and now she's like a, a third year counselor for me. And she said, this has actually been more fun than the in-person. Like she's just really enjoyed it. What we did is um, we're ACA accredited. So we kind of still adhere to that. And we always had two staff people in a room. So Michael, if you and I had a group of kids, you would have been in front leading the activity. And then I was behind the screen and I was doing all the logistics, managing the chat, telling Johnny to sit down, telling them what materials they needed, that, and just kind of watching all the Zoom screens to make sure everybody's okay. So we did two counselors in every room um, and one, and they each activity they swapped. And then when we programmed, that's how they programmed. So if you and I were in a group, Michael, and we had an 11, uh, a 10, 11, and a one, let's say you do the 10, I do the 11, and then you do the one again. So we each programmed for our own activities. Your, your, your counselors, how much computer tech savvy did they have? Or were they all basically fresh out of high school, college that are basically born and raised with technology? Yeah, they're all of them are, you know, 18. I think my oldest one is 24. So yeah, they're, it was not an issue for them. Um, yeah, um, I'm trying to, I have one person here. You think there was any issues technology wise? No, it would just be like if a camera got disconnected. Yeah, more like infrastructure stuff. So if the camera got disconnected or if the, the Wi-Fi went down one day and, you know, nobody's on campus, so I just can't call IT. So that was a scramble. But Sean here, he's my associate camp director, was able to put hardwire it. He got the hardwire line and put in. So little things like that, like logistics, we, we handled. But just I think the big, maybe the bigger point of your question, Michael, is that they just weren't scared of it. Like, all right, this is what it is you know, let's do it. And if you think about it, they're all FaceTiming, they're all doing that stuff. They're all in their Discord servers and doing all that stuff anyways. So this is almost like an extension uh, for them. And and the kids as well, it was just second nature to them. So like when we do Kahoot, some of the kids figured out that they had to go and run and get mom's phone so they could still see the questions. So like they just, you know, assimilation, they just figured it out. All right, like, mom, I need your phone. We're doing Kahoot. So it was interesting. But yeah, my staff, I, I think because of their age and that generation, I, I I don't even think the technology piece was, they even batted an eye out that. And, and I, I, I think you indicated that you had rooms designated for the Zoom mm -hmm. summer camps. Did anybody allow their staff to do the Zoom from their own home? Or did they require them to come into the facility and, and do the virtual camps? Our camp, uh, we weren't allowed to go on campus. So everyone did it from their own homes. I was sitting in my room with the Zoom with the virtual background um, but all of our staff were at home did you have any requirements I, I see you're with Cal Poly Pomona so special California I mean it, we are what we are uh, did you have any requirements that you could could not do you had to clock in a certain time I mean how did you clock in if you were at home so we ended up being able to um, get our clock in system to work remotely so that anyone could go online and just log into the website and clock in that way 
And to help counteract that and I guess like double check it, we also had another program that we would have everyone scheduled shifts. And so we'd have to compare their time card to their scheduled shifts and make sure it lined up before approving the time card. Um, and we, we would have everybody clock in, uh, I think it was five minutes before the session. So every, all the staff would have to be in the meeting five minutes before the session and then stay 15 minutes after to do a little debrief before signing off for the rest of the day. Yeah, for, for me, I actually pushed to get my staff on campus. Um, and aside from police services and physical plant management, we were the, and we're a campus of 40,000 students, we were the, the first department to come on campus after the stay at home order. So I had to create a 28 page document on what directions we were gonna use, how many people could be in a room, we're not gonna have a microwave, like all this crazy stuff. But I'll tell you, um, as much as it benefited the kids from being connected and having this experience, seeing my staff here every day in person, I mean, even though we don't high five and we're physically distant, like you can just tell for their mental well being, like this past seven weeks have just been a godsend for them because they've been stuck at home, you know, and if they don't have a roommate or a significant other, or if they're not at home, they've literally been on their own. So I, I really think that aside from us serving the campers, I think our organization really served our students because these students that are here, you can just tell that they like they're already dreading that it's done tomorrow because you can just see that they've enjoyed being together and not on FaceTime and not through a text and not over the phone, but actually six feet apart and hanging out. So it's, it's been really cool to see my set and I've enjoyed it cause I hated being home. So it's been fun, even though I'm, you know, I, I enjoyed being home and saving on gas, but I've, I haven't, I haven't worried about paying the gas money the last seven weeks because it's been fun to get out of the house too. Jeremy, will you guys, will your school be um, virtual or um, in person or hybrid? So the whole CSU system was already set for the fall. It's for sure virtual. Um, and then we'll see what happens from there. So I'm coming in next week to do some wrap up and then sadly I'll be gone from campus again for a few months. Yep. And then for my, I work for two universities, uh, Cal State San Bernardino, again, will all be all virtual. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Loma Linda University is where I'm at currently right now. Uh, it'll be a hybrid 50-50, depending on what program you're in. Because uh, again, we're medical based at this institution. So a lot of practical have to be done. You're out there with Trent and Aaron out at San Bernardino, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I know I still look young, but I've been around a while. I know, I know both of those very well. <laughs> Yep. Well, we took a slightly different approach to behavior management than what Jeremy did. Um, we only had one staff member in the room with about 20 campers. Um, but we also had a technology specialist on the call who would help with getting everybody in, getting them renamed, getting them into their breakout rooms. Anytime that there was tech issues, we could go to them just okay, let's jump over to the other breakout room and we'll figure out what's going on while your sound's not working. And so they would, the tech person would bounce between the different rooms as well as myself. I was on every single meeting. And if there was a meeting that I couldn't get to, then there was another admin that was in the meeting and they would bounce between rooms and keep an eye on behavior management, make sure they're not messing with the virtual background, make sure everything's camp appropriate. And uh, our staff learned, it was only a four week program but towards the end of the four weeks, our staff learned how to mute all. So when the campers are talking over everyone um, and there's like six campers trying to talk at the same time, they hit mute all and they wait a minute. And then the campers realize, oh, nobody can hear me. It's like, okay, so how was that being respectful? How can we be more respectful? And we start each session going over our full value contract, which is putting safety first, being respectful, respecting the camp environment. Um, making sure you're on mute and that kind of thing. So every session we'd start with those rules. And anytime there was any behaviors that went against our full value contract, if the staff themselves were too preoccupied to handle that behavior, because they were still trying to keep the rest of the group moving forward with the activity, we had a separate breakout room that we would move the problem child into. And I would jump into that room and have another, like the tech support jump in. And I'd have a discussion with them about how was your behavior okay? How can we adjust it for the future? Okay, are you ready to go back to your group and send them back to their group? 
So that's how we ended up doing behavior management. Yeah, one thing we noticed from the kids and we figured they got it from those couple months of doing online at the end of the spring semester was they were raising their hands. So they would just sit there and raise their hands. So our counselors got really used to that. But yeah, Marissa, we got to figure out a mute all for in-person camp because that mute all is amazing. <laughs> That's when you sit there and look at them and wait. Yeah, yeah we have one kid, Owen. Uh, we kept muting him and then I actually re I put him back in the waiting room and called his mom. And then his mom must have had a discussion with him because for the last three weeks, we have not heard peep from him. He's been a very good camper. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're coming up to the close of our session. Is there any well, other? Right quick, I was going to say probably another thing that's good with the, the Zoom camps or the virtual camps is if it's recorded. And I don't know if you could record it, but there was some discussion on that about being able to record it. But if you could record it, and if you did, and if there was an issue, you could very easily show mom or dad, this is what happened. Yeah, we debated recording ours um, just in the main room because in breakout rooms, you can't record. It'd be like separate recordings. Um, but we decided against it just because it's children and it's better safe than sorry. But we did have to, halfway through, I had to change my personal Zoom settings to completely disable recording because we'd get a message in our little Teams chat. We had one Teams chat that was like not connected to the Zoom at all so we could message other staff during the session. And we'd get a message, hey, it says somebody's recording but we don't know who's doing it. So we'd have to jump into the room, shut off recording and start all over again. So I really think it would be you know, a, a great idea for those who ran virtual camps um, to put together a presentation for a NERSA conference, you know. Um, I think they're still accepting presentations through, I think, a date in August. But um, I really think it would be, because I've gotten some really great information just listening to you guys. And, um, oh, August 10th. And I'm saying that the deadline for presentations is August 10th. They did extend the deadline. So, um, yeah, you should really think about some of you guys getting together. We don't know yet whether nurse is going to be in person or virtual. Um, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen, but I really think, you know, some of you like Michael and um, Jeremy, Marissa, who ran the camps, it would be a great idea, um, great information for people. So think about it. I think that'd be a fun thing to do, to share the information and what we've been through and different protocols we set in place. Yeah, for sure. So I think Marissa's getting ready to say that we uh, probably come up on our hour. Um, and yeah, there, there was a little discussion, you know, about do we do another one? You know, most people are probably getting ready for the fall semester um, or do we wait a while? I think there might be a second round of some round tables coming in. Um, so uh, Marissa, you wanna jump in? And um, just a idea of possibly doing another virtual or not virtual, but a, a round table like this in about three months. Uh, if anybody is interested, uh, you could throw it up in the chat so that we can have like a record. We were hoping that this would be a lot bigger of a session so that we could get more of a idea of what the interest is. But hopefully we could do another one and see how everyone's doing halfway through the fall semester. Will you folks be sending out surveys at the end of your camps to your parents and possible students as well to find out feedback? Yes, we do one every summer. Um, so I've already reached out. We have an, uh, luckily we have an assessment guy in our organization. So I've reached out to him. Um, so that we can obviously tailor it to because we won't need to ask about field trips or lunch or you know swim so we'll have to tailor it to that um we typically send out in mid-august because what we found over the years is if we send out our survey right after camp parents are focused on getting kids in the school and all that stuff so we typically wait till like mid-august and say hey remember us hope all is well going with school fill out this quick survey so yeah we're on track to do that again will you be able to share some of those results if possible yeah for sure 
Yep. I can, once I build the survey, I can share the, how the survey looks. And then once we, we usually keep it open for a month. So like mid September. Yeah. Can definitely share. Excellent. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to hear what comes back for sure. We did send one out. We sent one out at the end of each week. Um, just a, what was your campus favorite activities? What was their least favorite activities? And do you have any suggestions? Cause we're all wading through this virtual programming at the same time and trying to figure out how to run it. Um, so a lot of the feedback was it was good to have this virtual program, but we had a gap of about two hours in between our morning and afternoon session. And they were saying that was too long and having two sessions a day was a little too long too for the younger ones. And we are at our hour. Um, so this is going to be posted up on the NARSA website. And hopefully we'll be able to get uh, another one running in the fall, later on in the fall. So thank you all for joining us and we will hopefully see you next time. Thank Thanks you. for hosting. Thanks everybody. Bye.